I'm Kim Menzel, a food allergy informed social worker and moderator for today's discussion, Becoming a Food Allergy Advocate, which is organized by the Mary H. Weiser Food Allergy Center at the University of Michigan. As a social worker who engages families affected by food allergy, I know that some patients and caregivers are frustrated by the lack of awareness of safeguarding rules and of re resources for those affected by this disease. Many people find it, that it's very useful and therapeutic to channel their observations and frustrations into lobbying for practical measures that make life better for themselves and the food allergy community. Today, we welcome two families who have used their experiences with food allergy to drive meaningful policy changes that have affected people on the local, state, and federal level. Despite having no prior experience in activism or advocacy, from better signage at playgrounds to organizing support groups to federal legislation, our guests have prompted significant changes and they have tips and advice. And we want to see who else might want to get involved. We're delighted to welcome today's panel. We have Jill Midlin, who is a practicing finance attorney in New York City. She's co-led a support group and has been advocating on the local, state, and federal level to help people with food allergies since her daughter, who is anaphylactic to milk, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, and sesame, was born 22 years ago. Stacy Science and Jared Science. Um, Stacy is a University of Michigan graduate who has served on the Mary H. Weiser Food Allergy Center Advisory Board since 2019. She's an advocate for food allergy awareness and was named one of the top 100 women in food allergies. Mrs. Science, Ms. Science has helped to spearhead the passage of several pieces of local state, federal legislation that protect those living with food allergies. Her son, Jared, a high school freshman who was born with 26 anaphylactic allergies has helped advocate for the passage of several pieces of local, state, and federal legislation, including a law that allows school bus drivers to administer epinephrine, a self-carry law, a law that allows schools to stock epinephrine, the FASTER Act, and most recently, the Westchester County Food Allergy Restaurant Safety Bill, which he'll speak with us about today. Additionally, he founded Pack the Pantry for Everyone, a nonprofit that helps tackle hunger for food insecure families with food allergies. Thanks for joining us today. Let's start by hearing a bit of each of your backgrounds and your experience with the food allergy diagnosis. If we can start with you, Stacy. So I was a practicing um, litigator prior to having both of my boys. And after um, Jared was born, we diagnosed Jared at around five months old with 26 anaphylactic food allergies. So I decided to stay home and take care of Jared. And because I had this um, legal background, I really wanted to, um, I asked our allergist at the time, you know, what can I do to make a difference? And he um, told me that, you know, I could advocate to help pass laws that would um, protect everyone living with food allergies. And through that process, I was able to meet up with Jill Midland, who had already, she'll tell you, but she had already been advocating. And so I started advocating. And as soon as Jared was old enough, starting at age four, he started coming up with us to Albany and advocate with us. Jill, can you jump in and tell us about your experience as a parent who has a daughter with food allergies? Sure. Well, I'm going to start at the beginning of the story when uh, Maya was nine months old and she had her first anaphylactic reaction to dairy. Um, it's just overwhelming as a parent. You know, you can try to prepare to be a parent, but nothing prepares you for seeing what you see when a baby goes into anaphylaxis. So it's very overwhelming. It's very scary. Uh, we ultimately determined she was anaphylactic to not quite as much as Jared, but uh, dairy, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, and sesame seeds. So some of the you know main ingredients in most foods that you'll see today. Um, it's very lonely in the beginning, right? Because you have this child, you have this life-threatening diagnosis and you're dealing with reactions and it can be just very frightening and very lonely. So that was why I decided to start uh, a support group with some friends of mine who were going through the same thing. And Gosh, we started 20 years ago before there were even computers or email. So we had in-person meetings and we would have speakers and basically uh, just try to help each other in, in whatever way we could. Uh, fortunately, now with the advent of the Internet, there are support groups available to, to everyone out there, whether you can go in person or just meeting others online and connecting. And it just helps so much to get through all of this. 
Thank you, Jill. I think you really touch on some things that we see with newly diagnosed uh, caregiver, the patients and their caregivers. There's an overwhelm. There's an uncertainty about what, where to find reliable, accurate information, how to find a sense of community. Now, I'm sure our audience would like to hear more about each of your first steps into the grassroots world of advocacy. Jill, I understand, for example, that you worked with a camp that Maya attended, and that's something um, we hear families talk a lot about. Is it safe for my child to go to a summer camp? Yeah. Can my child go to after school events? So how did you begin to ensure that it was safe for Maya and other kids with food allergies? Well, one of the things I did was I followed the advice that I learned from a, a parent who was a few years ahead of where I was in the process at the North American Food Allergy Conference up in Canada when Maya was just a baby. And she said, don't borrow trouble from the future. And it took me a while to understood what she was saying. She said, if you have a two-year-old, which I did at the time, who has to get to nursery school safely tomorrow, don't borrow trouble from the future and worry about how she's going to get married and how she's going to date and how she's going to go to college. Start with what you have in front of you that you need to tackle. And that's what we did. So we started with nursery school. I had a, I have a son who's two years older than Maya who doesn't have food allergies. And so we called him our starter kid because he would get me in the door wherever I needed to be for Maya two years before Maya got there. So I joined the nursery school board right away when he was in nursery school so that by the time Maya arrived two years later, the nursery school was prepared for how to deal with a kid like Maya. Same thing with elementary school, even religious school, et cetera. But the camp thing um, was sort of a curveball for us. So she had been talking about sleepaway camps since she was about five or six years old, which is younger than when most kids go. Most children start maybe eight, nine, 10 years old. But so from the time she could think about camp, all she wanted to do was go to sleepaway camp. And I kept saying, except for the food allergies, she is the perfect sleepaway camp kid. And Stacy knows her very well. She'd be great at this. She would love this. But I just couldn't imagine. You have, you have to sort of put yourself where I was back then. So she was five or six years old. At that point, she had probably anaphylaxed eight or 10 times. Uh, we had nearly lost her twice. And I had not yet been dropping her off safely, you know, leaving her alone at play dates. You know, I would go on the play date with her and ask the parent, can I sit in your house and, you know, while she's here? So the thought of giving her to strangers for eight weeks to feed three meals a day and what I subsequently learned, as I'll tell you about my experience at camp, that's not the only place that there's food involved. Every day at three o'clock was milk and cookies. Keep in mind, my girl was definitely allergic to milk and pretty much every ingredient in the cookies. Uh, every evening, there was canteen where the kids got to go crazy and eat as much candy as they wanted to. Every day, there were field trips and, and sporting events. So I just couldn't figure out how to do it safely. And I would think, OK, I got this. I, I, I can handle it. And then I'd wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, like, what am I doing? I can't send her away to strangers for eight weeks. So um, long story short, and talking to a friend, I learned that there was a position at a camp called food allergy coordinator. And my friend said, oh, you should send your daughter to this camp. They have a food allergy coordinator. And I said, nope. I was actually between um, legal jobs at the time. I'm also an attorney. And I said, nope, I think I'm going to pitch myself as the food allergy coordinator for a camp. And that's what I did. And, and in that position, Maya was able to go to sleepaway camp for six years. For six years, I went away for 12 weeks every year and I trained all the counselors, I trained all the staff. Believe it or not, we had, it was like a small hospital because there were 800 campers at camp and staff, campers and staff. So there was always doctors and nurses, but I even had to work to train them because even the doctors and nurses don't get it like a food allergy parent gets it. So what I started with about, I think there were six kids like Maya when I started to take care of them. Um, by the time I left the camp six years later, there were about 30 people, campers and counselors, who I was managing with 30 different sets of life-threatening food allergies. So it was, uh, to this day, the most difficult, stressful, and rewarding job I've ever had. But she did uh, thank me for it publicly at a conference once, so that felt good. She said, I never said this to my mom, but I really appreciate that she did that so I could go to sleep away camp. <laughs> so it, it is doable, and obviously not everybody can afford to go away for 12 weeks every summer for six years, but there people work with the camp, they can make sure that it's being handled the way I handled it for six summers. That's what I wondered, Jill, for those parents who might be listening and saying, well, I, I can't go, but where would they start asking questions 
and beginning mm-hmm. to have conversations, what would you say, how, what kinds of things can they cover? What, what, how should they begin that process? I would say the first thing you have to do is reach out to the director of the camp. Don't try to talk to anybody below them. You have to find out at the top that it's being handled seriously and that the needs are being taken into consideration. And from there, then, you know, once you get that comfort level with the owner slash director of the camp, then you can work with the infirmary staff or the counselors or whoever else you want to when your child is actually going. You can have meetings with those people and explain the specifics about your child's food allergies. But to start, you have to start at the top. You have to make sure that it's ingrained in the camp, the importance of this, um, the that they have to be willing to accommodate you. Not every camp is. Even before our sleepaway camp, when we were looking at day camps for Maya, there was a camp that told us, look, we're just not interested in accommodating you. We're not interested in trying to make this safe for her. So we don't go there. You know, that's that's the thing. You want to find the camp that's right for your camper, but also specifically that they're going to listen to you and meet your needs and make the accommodations necessary for the food allergies. I have to imagine that also made Maya uh, be a tremendously good advocate for herself to be able to ask a lot of questions, to be able to keep reminding people and reinforcing her own needs. I think that's the most important thing we do as food allergy parents, and I know Stacy would agree, that what we're doing is we're modeling for them. Right? You know, Maya actually once asked me, she said, why do you do all this stuff for me? You know, I would run to birthday parties if there was a birthday party where they were making Mickey Mouse pancakes, then I would bring my own Mickey Mouse pancake shaped thing and make her. She said, very young, she said to me, why are you doing all this for me? And I said, because I need you to see what you need to do for your daughter. Because there's a genetic component and there's a likelihood that if she has food allergies like she does so severe to so many things that her child will as well. And I said, it's important for you to see what needs to be done so that you can do this for your daughter but obviously also for herself. And that that's, I think Stacy would agree, the toughest thing that we do as food allergy parents. And the most important thing we do is to turn over the reins to them so that they can learn to advocate. And Jared, I know was a perfect example of that. I'm sorry, Maya couldn't be here today, but Jared, I know is tremendous at advocating for himself and for others. Stacy, can you tell us about some of the local initiatives that you and Jared have been involved in? And I know some of which are playground signage how did you begin for, with an idea and then take it into development? So Jared and I had seen a, um, we live in Chappaqua and in Armonk right next to us, in their playgrounds, they had these signs that alerted um, everyone who was on the playground that there are one in 13 children who are living with food allergies and to please not, you know, to eat your food on the picnic benches and not on um, the playground equipment and um, how you can keep your friends with food allergies safe. And so Jared said, I wonder if we can bring these to Chappaqua. And so together we wrote a letter and we wrote a letter to the town board and to the town supervisor. And we sent some pictures of the signs that we had seen and we advocated for why we thought that this was important um, in Chappaqua to, you know, for the town of Newcastle to keep all of their neighbors with food allergies safe. And we heard back and she, um, the town supervisor thought this was a really great idea. She asked us to give her um, different options of wording for the signs, which Jared and I collected. We looked at all different playgrounds that had already adopted these signs and um, gave her different language. And um, it actually, it was, this was something that didn't take that long. It only took a couple months. And they, we have 10 playgrounds that are run by our town. And in all 10 playgrounds, there are now signs. Um, and so that was something that anyone can do. You know, lots of times where Jared and I and Jill get our ideas is if another state passes something that's really um, important for people in the food allergic world, we say, okay, let's copy that and bring it to our state. And, and um, so this was something that we saw somewhere else and we wanted to bring back to um, our local community. So Jared, I think you were in fourth grade when you first worked on an initiative to train school bus drivers to be able to use auto injectors. How did you do that? Um, so in fourth grade, when I was really young, you know, I was one of those kids who always wanted to hang out with my friends. I wanted to be included like always. And it was actually my first time at a new school. So everyone would always talk about like riding the bus and I'd be like, are you riding the bus today? Are you going on the bus today? And like the bus was like the cool thing back then. And my whole life, I always wanted to ride the bus. So 
And one time I asked my mom, like, why am I not allowed to ride the bus? Because I didn't really know why I wasn't allowed to. And she told me that the bus drivers weren't allowed to give the EpiPen, which didn't really make sense to me. And I was like, could we do something to change this? So we proposed we so we proposed a law for the school bus driver to administer the epinephrine. So we successfully met with Senator Terrence Murphy and Assemblyman David Buckwald, who are our local assemblymen and senators, and we asked them if they could would sponsor this for us. And they agreed on to it. They thought it was a great idea. And so every year we traveled to Albany to advocate for different laws. And we traveled to Albany that year. We advocated for this law very well. Not just us, but many other food allergy advocates. My and Jill. My and Jill included. <laughs> and um, everyone who we talked to thought it was a great idea. And, you know, it was, it wasn't, it's not a hard thing. It's just they need a little training and it's enough to save a kid's life. And so we spoke at my school, like when it finally got passed, it went through the Senate, it went through the Assembly and Cuomo signed on to it and it got passed. And we had a press conference at my school where with set, with Assembly member David Buckwald, where they were asking us questions about it, which was really cool. And for my first time riding the bus, there was also another kid from my school who had allergies, who had never ridden the bus because he, his mom had the same idea. Like you, she doesn't want you to ride the bus because it's not safe. And he, he was so excited to ride the bus as well. And <laughs> that's like what I'm trying to do. Like, I'm not only trying to help myself, but I'm trying to help everyone else with food allergies. So it'd be for a safer world. So yeah, that was my first law. That's amazing. And I know you also helped the local food pantry carry safe food. And I know that's one thing we realize it's a huge barrier because food that is safe for people with allergies can often be really expensive and not found in food pantries. So what did you do there that made more food available to people in your community? Uh, so during COVID, like during the middle of COVID, it was even harder to find like allergy ingredients, safe foods for me because everything was running out of stock. Everyone was supplying. And one night during dinner, I asked my mom, what happens to the kids with food allergies who are lying in food pantries? Because right next to my Hebrew school in Mount Kisco, there's a food pantry called Mount Kisco Interfaith Food Pantry. And when I used to go there a lot when during Hebrew school and help out. And I would see that there wasn't really any section for food allergies, like safe foods for anything. It was just like put together. And so I asked my mom if we could make a change to this. And she gave me the phone number and I called the food pantry and they thought it was a great idea. And they asked me to make food allergy protocols. Oh. After that, I decided to make a nonprofit, which is called Pack the Pantry for Everyone. And this is not just for this food pantry, Mount Kisco Interfaith Food Pantry, but we're trying to get it at all pantries. So for everyone, so it's safe. And so I contacted a bunch of food pantries and offered free allergy protocols. And I think it's all... Some feeding Westchester. Mm -hmm. um, they have their meeting next week, but they are hoping to adopt them and um, give them to all the pantries that feeding Westchester uh, is responsible for. So they um, they took Jared's protocols and they made them into a new document that has their logo and it also has Jared's pack the pantry for everyone logo and it will go to all Westchester food pantries that come under their umbrella. Are you able to show us the website and the flyers yeah. you created? Yes. I know people are listening to us and will be listening in the future in states across the nation. And I'm sure that they can take some of what you did and bring it to their own food pantries. Mm -hmm. So this is the our website pack, the pantry forever and dot com. And this is me with the Buffalo Bills mascot because we filmed a commercial with the Buffalo Bills about food allergies. And so we have an about us page where, where did it go oops sorry oh pantry. well we'll just go to the pantry flyer first so this is our flyer that we give to all the pantries and it has it lists the top nine allergens 
in English, Spanish, and, and symbols. So we give this to the pantry and they hang it up. And when people walk in, they see it and they tell them what they're allergic to. And by that, the pantry asks us for food to order or get or donate to them or that they can just buy so mm -hmm. the people can eat safe. And so if somebody wanted to do this in, let's say, Michigan, what would be something you would tell them? How could they start? Um, I I guess they could. Well, first they could use our flyer because it's no different than anything else. It's the same top nine allergens. And all they have to do is call their local food pantry or any food pantry and talk to them about why this is a good idea and how it would make a more safe world for the people who can't normally afford foods at like Whole Foods and normal restaurants, but I mean, normal stores, but at like food pantries. So it's an easier way for them to eat and eat more safe and not have to worry. So I know we heard you talk about previously, um, I'm not sure who it was, they used the phrase food allergy protocol. Can, can, one of you say more about that for people that might not understand exactly what we're referring to. So the food pantry said to Jared, you know, we never thought about um, people who come in who are food insecure, who also have food allergies before. What do you think that, you know, we should do? What types of protocols should we put in place? And so Jared came back and said, well, what if we make out, um, this was during COVID. So he said, can we make a flyer? Um, at the time, people weren't coming into the pantry. They were just handing bags out. And let's put the flyer in everyone's bags. And then also for that same flyer, the, um, Jared blew it up and had it laminated, um, two um, really big boards. And they had that outside where everyone was picking food up. And so um, basically the food pantry asked everybody on this flyer whether they, they were allergic or someone in their family was allergic to the top nine allergens. Uh, all the clientele came back and told them what they were allergic to or what someone in their family was allergic to. And so the pantry was able to collect data on, and it's ongoing, on what allergens they need to provide for, what alternative safe food. So at our local food pantry, there are a lot of people who have a dairy allergy and need an alternative milk. There are a lot of people who have wheat allergy um, or celiac, and they need alternative um, pastas or grains. And so we were able to rate. So Jared, um, yeah, Jared, I'd um, like to tell you. So this year I love playing basketball. And so I decided that maybe a good idea to raise money to buy food for the food pantry and to supply these allergy friendly foods. I was going to host a basketball tournament in my town. And for my first year, we got 127 people to join it. And we got a lot of sponsors from people and we raised ten thousand dollars and all of this money is going to go to supply allergy friendly food to the food pantry so they'll tell us what they need or but we'll give them the money and with that they can buy what they need for these people with food allergies since you mentioned playing basketball mm -hmm. i know one of the things we hear a lot is um how to do that safely would you mind just i know we didn't ask you to share that but is there anything you can tell parents and kids who might hear this about how can they play sports safely with food allergies i mean it's a lot of just you have to look around first and see like if you're going in to play basketball let's say and someone's eating you could kindly ask them to you know wash their hands or Maybe you can even carry a wipe with you so you could wipe your hands after or before, make sure not to touch your face or anything. And it's a lot of just like seeing what's around you and knowing like if someone's, if the ball is going to have it. But I always make sure to wash my hands before, before and after. So I know that I'm safe and I make sure not to touch my face when I play in Kate because I don't want to spread allergens. And it's a lot easier than I thought it would be because I've been playing a lot of sports my whole life and I've never had a problem with it. And it's just, it's mostly just about washing your hands and making sure that you're clean and making sure that people like sometimes at recess, I'll see like someone will eat something I'm allergic to. I'll just ask them if they could wipe their hands before because I'm allergic to it. 
So I could add just a little bit to that. Um, I would yeah. say for, for the parents' perspective, it's a matter of, you know, working with the coaches and if it's a school-based sport, working with the schools. I was fortunate to have such a great relationship with our school district that they actually um, work with me, even if my daughter's not taking that sport or if she's not in that particular school building, I work with the coaches and, and make sure that everybody is trained in how to prevent, recognize, and respond to an anaphylactic reaction and that they have stock epinephrine everywhere in the schools for these kids. It's actually come in handy more than once, believe it or not, that I was called and, you know, they just thanked me for making them aware and making them have stock epinephrine because they have actually used it in our school. So so Maya is a gymnast. Mm -hmm. she so, is. I mean, as a competitive gymnast, I imagine you traveled and mm -hmm. you had lots of unfamiliar situations. What are other things you would tell parents, Jill, who are thinking, there's no way we can do that safely. We can't manage meals away like that. We It wouldn't be safe to be with so many kids who are going to be eating snacks. How to do that? I would say the first thing I would say to the parents is everything is possible. It just mm -hmm. takes more prep work when you're the parent of a food allergic child. That's all. I would. Mm -hmm. I, I This is something that I've counseled my my co-leaders and I have counseled our support group members on for years when whenever somebody says, well, I can't do this. I can't do that. Take that out of the vocabulary. Everything that every other child does, your child can do. You just have to prepare in advance. So it's just, it's like the same. I would say that having a competitive gymnast is the same as going out to dinner in the restaurant or going on a trip around the world. Everything just means you have to prepare. You have to do your research. You have to speak to the people who are going to be involved, particularly the adults. You have to make sure there's somebody trained in how to use an epinephrine auto injector that will be with her at all times. Make sure that either you send safe food for her or there will be safe food available for her. So it's just it's just an extra level of prep work that we have to do, but everything is possible. I agree completely with Jill. Everything, and that's what I've always said to um, Jared, anything he wants to do is possible. You just takes it, um, it can't be spontaneous. We have to <laughs> fix for it. He has a lot of basketball tournaments that, you know, will be gone for nine or 10 hours, um, you know, a couple hours away at the tournament. And I just have to plan and prepare and bring all of his food and his snacks and, you know, epinephrine and wipes. And um, like Jared says, I am the mom who, you know, all the kids know and they, are happily, like after everyone eats, I give everybody wipes and they're happy to do it because they care about their teammate. And um, so I might embarrass him a little bit, but um, it's easy to do. And, and like Jill was talking earlier about camp, I wasn't able to go and stay at our camp. They didn't have a position like that. But similarly, um, I'm able to, because I'm not working full time, we have a lake house that's about um, 40 minutes from Jared's camp, the camp that Jer Jared's older brother was going to, he wanted to go to, and they were not um, prepared to cook for someone with Jared's allergies. And so for the past six years, I've been cooking meals and I come and I drop them off every morning before Jared wakes up and he has his own little refrigerator and microwave when he was younger. Um, Someone in the kitchen staff would warm up his food for him and give it to him. But now that he's older, he, you know, uses the refrigerator and the microwave and warms up his food each day. Um, so it's everything can be done. It just takes extra um, thought and preparation. I will tell you the only time I ever said no, it wasn't no so much as not yet. Um, Maya was in a rock band with at her music school and they were planning on touring China. Well, not her band. The, the school always puts together a little band of kids to tour China as a rock band. And she was, I guess, I don't know, eight or nine years old at the time. And what happened was somebody dropped out of that year's trip uh, about a week before they were supposed to leave. And they called me and they said, would Maya be able to fill in on this tour throughout China for, <laughs> with these kids, the rock band? And I said, you know what? I have never said the word no before in her life for something related to her food allergies, but this I cannot put together in a week. I cannot get the requisite medical documentation translated into the appropriate languages. I can't get the food there because the food had to be shipped. I said, if you want her next year on this trip, she'll be there, but I cannot do it in a week. So it just takes a little prep time, like Stacey was saying. So you did go the next, next year, didn't we you? We did. We did. Absolutely. And it was an experience of a lifetime and she got to tour China like a little rock star and it was wonderful. But um, I did go as one of the chaperones, which was helpful. But yeah, but I need even as even with me going with her, I needed that year really to prepare for that trip. Jared, can I just ask along these same lines, how old were you when you started to self-administer or um, I guess 
uh, were prepared to do that. Um, yeah. I mean, I've been carrying my EpiPens alone since kindergarten, so I've known like how to do it since then. I've definitely been frightened. Like, I never want to really give it to myself. Now I'm old enough where I learned that it's not, it's saving my life. It's not anything big. It's, it's well, it is big because it saves my life, but it's not anything harmful. And so I guess probably when I was in kindergarten, like I really started learning how to give myself the Abby pen, like put it in my thigh. And I had been given it before, so I knew how it worked. I knew that it doesn't really hurt that much. It's like one, it's like 10 seconds and then it's done. And it's really a lifesaver. So I probably in kindergarten is when I started learning how to administer the epinephrine. If I could ask a follow-up question though for Jared, I would say, um, not necessarily when did you learn to administer epinephrine, but when did you start advocating for yourself? I'm going to bet it was younger than kindergarten. Um, (laughs) Well, I started advocating for myself when I was four years old, which was my first time going to Albany. And now I've been going for, I guess, 11 years now, which is a long time. So I've been advocating for 11 years now. Well, and he had a good, oh, sorry, I was going to oh. say he had a, uh, he had a very good role model in Maya, Jill's daughter, um, taught Jared, you know, how to advocate. <laughs> they were together as little, little ones. Yep. And now Maya sits on the board of Jared's nonprofit. So. Right. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so what kinds of initiatives have, have you all been involved in that have impact on the federal level? You want to start, Cisco? Sure. So the most recent thing that um, Jill and I and Jared and others have worked on is the passing of the FASTER Act. So uh, Jared and Maya also both had a have a sesame allergy. And um, one of the aspects of the FASTER Act is that it required sesame to become the ninth allergen that would be required to be labeled for. And Jared uh, went, to, uh, went to the FDA and testified before the FDA and... Well, not not just Jared, but a lot of other advocates as well to share why it's so important for Sesame to be labeled for. Um, it was one of those things that companies could hide in their label. They could say spices, and if you know, so as a food allergy mom, I would never buy anything until I mean, I would never I would buy it, but I wouldn't give it to him until I was positive that there wasn't Sesame. So every single time I there was something I wanted to give to Jared, I would have to call the company, and it would take a while to get to the right person, and I'd say, "Is Sesame included in um, spices?" And sometimes the company would tell you, and sometimes they would tell you it's proprietary and they couldn't share that information. So the fact that it now has to be labeled for, um, it just, it, it's really amazing. Sadly, there's been a little bit of, um, you know, some companies are now adding sesame because they don't want to have to clean their lines. They said it's too difficult to clean their lines. So they're now adding sesame to some products on some breads, which is disappointing, but hopefully we'll get beyond that. And just the fact that um, it's, there's transparency and we now know whether or not sesame is in an item is uh, very exciting. So that was one of the bills that we worked on, but Jill worked on something even more important about labeling before that. So I'll let her. Talk. Oh, the, well, you're talking about the FALFA, but the, yeah, the precursor to faster. So the reason that the food was labeled other than sesame for the other top allergens, which we used to call the top eight before sesame was added and called the top nine is because of something called FALCBA, which was Food Allergy Labeling Consumer Protection Act. And that was um, the legislation that made it mandatory for companies to label if one of the top eight food allergens was in their food. So prior to that, you have to understand, because this came about in Maya's lifetime when she was allergic to so many of the top eight. Prior to FALCPA, people don't know, but if your example, if for example, your child was allergic to milk, like mine was, there were a list of approximately a hundred synonyms for milk. And any one of them could be on a label and you wouldn't know that that meant there was milk in there unless you had gone like we would go to the hospital and when, when she would get a new allergen diagnosed, they would give us the list and say, okay, now here's the hundred things you have to look for on a label that might mean milk. And here's the 50 things that might mean eggs. And here's the 75 things that might mean nuts. And you would just, I mean, hours and hours and hours were spent in the supermarket trying to look for all of these different words. So yeah. FALPA came along and it standardized that. So if any of those 100 items that were synonyms for milk were in the product, the product must say milk, either in the label itself as one of the ingredients or below that it must say contains milk. 
So that was probably the most important thing we worked on. One other thing I want to point out of the FASTER Act is it helps both Maya and Jared because it added Sesame to the list, but it also made it possible in the future to add other allergens as prevalence shows that they they're it's warranted. So they don't have to go through this process and pass another FASTER Act every time it turns out, like I hear, I believe corn is probably the next highest on the prevalence. So if that sort, sort of starts to bump up in prevalence, they'll be able to add that to FALCBO without having to reopen all the legislation again. So what other initiatives on the state or local level can we hear from you about um, things that you've been in, involved in? And, and also I'm sure people would like to hear, you know, as, as people who are living with food allergies, how does it help you in terms of feeling a sense of resilience, feeling like, is it, is it, does it also have a healthy impact on your, on your mental health, having taken these actions? Jared, did you want to speak about that? Uh, sure. Um, um, well, I feel like my voice is huge because I've learned that from advocating that my voice makes a big change and that sometimes when I meet with these lawmakers, several times they had no idea like the severe, severeness of food allergies and how effective food allergies can be on a human being. And sometimes they're even shocked, like they're in full shock of how this could ever happen to someone. And our job is just to educate them and make sure they're aware of this and it's not hurting anyone to do this. It's just helping people. And that's like what our, all our mindsets are always. And it's I've learned a lot from it that many people aren't aware, but our job is to educate them. It's, I, I've noticed that it, it's um, been so powerful because Jared, you know, he was born with 26 anaphylactic allergies um, and he's never felt sorry for himself. I mean, maybe he does internally, but he's never, you know, outright complained like life isn't fair. He's never said anything like that. And I think it's because from an early age, Jared's been advocating for, you know, food allergy legislation for everyone to make everyone's life better. And I think, and he's been able to, he's luckily been able to see, you know, some of these bills come to fruition and, um, you know, he's seen how he's been able to use his voice and share his story with different politicians to actually make a difference. And so I think that that's part, I think it's kind of like what you've said, you know, instead of having a condition that, you know, you could sit back and say, oh, this is the worst thing. And, you know, this is terrible. My life's not fair. Instead of having that, you say, well, you know what, I have this, but what can I do to make a difference and make life better for everyone? And so that's what Jared and Maya and, you know, everyone who has, food, you know, who has food allergies and advocates does. And I think that it does help with your mental health because it shows you that you can make a difference. Absolutely. It helps with our mental health too, which I'll get to in a moment. But I wanted to say something about the first time that I personally saw Maya advocate for herself. I will never forget. Um, again, remember I had that starter kid who got into nursery school two years ahead. So by the time Maya got to nursery school, lo and behold, every year in May, we had a food allergy awareness week at the nursery school. And we utilized tools that we got from some of the national not-for-profits on how to teach children about it was called Protect a Life. That was the campaign, How to Be a Pal, P-A-L, Protect a Life. And there were a series of videos and games and things that you could learn about how to protect your friends with food allergies. Because believe it or not, even at the ages of two and three in nursery school, these kids are on the front lines. They could think to themselves, ooh, maybe I shouldn't share this food with my friend. Or, ooh, my friend looks sick. Maybe I should tell a teacher. So there were very, very simple tenets that could help even on the front lines of two and three-year-olds. So I had gone in that week and worked with all the nursery school classes and taught them everything. And it killed me because her best friend was absent that week, a little girl named Molly. And so I asked the teacher, could I have permission to come back another day just to work with Molly? Because it was really important to me that Molly understood all of this. And the teacher said that would be fine. And my three-year-old looked up at me, Maya, and she said, um, Mom, uh, Molly's my best friend and I'm the one with food allergies. So don't you think I should teach her about it? And that was sort of where... That was where I was born. That was where the ad, little baby advocate was born. And subsequently, she, like Jared, has been doing all this work on the local, state, and federal level. And also, in particular, I think what helps her mental health is that she likes to be a mentor to the younger ones. So she's involved. There's a, a camp, a day camp for parents who don't feel comfortable sending their children to normal, regular camps for 
because of the food allergies, there's actually a week long day camp that uh, one of the not for profits runs. So she's a counselor at that camp and she speaks at a lot of the teen conferences and teen summits. And that's how she gets comfortable is helping others like Jared was saying. But I think for Stacy and myself, and I don't want to speak for both of us, but I think one of the reasons that I got into advocacy, and I think Stacy mentioned this as well. So we both have legal backgrounds, we're both attorneys. And I think for us, the, the mental health kick that we got from it, if you will, is getting some control back because you feel so out of control with food allergies. And I always say like people find their, however, their own talents can best be used to help the food allergy community. Like we know somebody who's up in Westchester, who's a tremendous baker. So she started an incredible baking company for foods top, free of the top nine allergens. And I have a friend who's a, in the, um, film industry. So she's done documentaries and stuff about food allergies. But for Stacy and I, this is where, where we're trained. This is what we do. We're lawyers. So we felt like, okay, at least I can get some control. I can do some legislation. That's helpful. So I think the advocacy work helps on the mental health level uh, for the kids and the parents as well. Jared, do you think it's been helpful to you in terms of like feeling that you can speak up, that you can have open conversations with other kids? Uh, yes, I do feel like it's been helpful to me because when I was younger, I felt like it was kind of scary to talk to other kids, like speak up. I didn't want them to think different of me. I was a little embarrassed. But that, as we got under, older, a lot of people are more understanding and they actually are willing to do what they need to do for me to be safe and for everyone to be safe. And I feel like it's really helpful when I grow up and I've learned that I can advocate for myself, I can speak for myself and people will listen to me. And if they don't listen to me, I'll just do something else because, but everyone really does listen to me. And I feel like my voice is very powerful and I've learned that throughout my life. I'd love to ask you, and, and I don't want to put you on the spot if, if it's not something that you're comfortable talking about, but you know, we always hear parents talk about the fear of bullying and we know that food allergy bullying is real and many parents and kids can experience that. Is there anything you would say about that just from your experience? Um, have you ever had to deal with feeling picked on, excluded, left out, or someone saying mean things? And if not, what would you say to other kids? Who have food allergies like you? I don't feel, I don't think I've ever been like bullied or anything. I've definitely felt left out of things that I couldn't do because of my allergies. Like maybe like school projects or something that I couldn't do because it included a food that, but for the kids that might be or have before, I really think they shouldn't listen. They should be proud of themselves. of themselves and speak up because if that's the only way you can make a change is by speaking up for you themselves. And I always think this is where education is so key as well. Um, having gone in and done even just that work in the nursery schools that I did with the kids, I will never forget when I came in one day because there was they were going to be celebrating a birthday of one of the little kids. And I'm saying these kids were two and three years old. And a whole bunch of her little friends ran over to me and they said, did you make sure to bring a safe treat for Maya? Because there's going to be treats and we want to make sure there's a safe treat for Maya. Now, without the education that we had brought into the nursery school about food allergies and the importance of protecting a life of your friend, of being a pal, I feel like, you know, Maya might have experienced more bullying. She was fortunate. I think she would agree with Jared and say that she never did experience it. But I think that a big part of that was educating the people around her and setting the tone, if you will, to make it clear that this is not something to be bullied about. This is something to help, you know. Exactly. I agree with that. And actually, um, to the end about education, so Jared's camp, um, you know, I always used to educate uh, all of, you know, the kids that he went to camp with um, about cross-contamination. And I use the example with like glitter, you know, and the kids, you stick your hand mm -hmm. in glitter and then everything you touch, that glitter gets on to um, because Jared, one of his allergies is dairy and that it's that cheese dust that's on pyrofoodie and some other snacks. Mm. And so the camp actually um, decided that they wouldn't serve um, pyrofoodie and cheese. It's and those types of snacks that had that cheese residue. But one time there was somebody new in the kitchen and they passed out the snack to everyone Do you remember and they passed out the snack to everyone. And, um, you know, Jared knew immediately that he needed to leave the dining hall, but his best friend at camp 
was so upset and hysterical that they can't call me. And they said, Jared's okay. But his best <laughs> friend is so traumatized and so worried about Jared and so upset that this happened at the camp. So it's, it's that same idea that the education, you know, and kids too, they want to protect their friends and they want to be mm -hmm. a friend. And if they know and understand it, they won't make fun of it. They'll instead want to be. It enables them to be empathetic. It really yes. does. And that's, that's empowering for those kids too. You know, those kids who ran over to me to protect their friend, it's empowering for them as well to feel empathy like that. So absolutely. Stacy and Jared, can you share with us, I know you showed us the plaque that you just oh. received mm -hmm. from some of your most recent advocacy work. Sure. So um, recently, last year, Jared, you know, his friends, he's, he's a teenager now. And so his friends always go out to restaurants and he goes with them, but he never orders anything. And so we, we decided that we were going to go meet with our Westchester County legislator. So this is more on a local level um, to have, there was a, there was a bill that was passed in Jillstown in Nassau County that um, required restaurants to label on their menus for the top nine allergens and also to give training to um, at least three people on staff you know that so one person always had to be at the restaurant who has training on how to prevent cross contamination how to serve a customer with food allergies and so um this bill was passed last year jared testified at the meetings and um we were able to get it passed and just coincidentally today um the westchester legislator gave us a framed copy <laughs> i'll show you of the bill with the pen that our county executive used to sign it so it's very what is that? So what's that like for you, Jared, to see these things come into being? Um, I think it's really cool to see them come into being because at first it's just an idea and then it becomes, you know, a bunch of talk and advocate it. And then when it really hits is when it, so it's signed or it goes into an actual law. And it's really exciting to see that because it's like all this hard work wasn't for nothing and it's it's sometimes like yeah we gotta pass it exciting but we also need to get a bunch of other things passed too because not everything's safe but it's really exciting when these things happen so um jill i know we maybe didn't hear all of the advocacy work that you've done or, or what you're working on now is there something that you're feeling really impassioned about today well i think the biggest thing that Stacy and I have been working on for years. And again, you know, some wow. laws passed in six months, some we're on, I don't know if it's year 12 or 15 at this point, but it's just a very simple thing that we're trying to get accomplished. We're trying to get education into the teachers. So um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the story. There was a little boy who passed away in a nursery school in uh, New York city uh, named Elijah and his father helped start Elijah's law so that all nursery schools or daycare centers must be trained in how to prevent, recognize, and respond to an anaphylactic reaction. We are now just trying to get that same concept that we've been trying for 15 years into the <laughs> elementary schools, grade K through 12. Mm -hmm. Very simple, 10 minute online training for all teachers. I, I won't even go into all the craziness we've been dealing with, but that's what we've been working on the most. But my passion has always actually been with the schools in general. I think when I first started, the first thing I did was work on, as I said, my daughter's nursery school, then her elementary school, and then her that turned into her school district, and then uh, Nassau County. This was all for guidelines on how to protect children in schools. And ultimately, I think the work that I'm probably, the one piece of legislation that I'm proudest of um, was a piece of legislation that required the Department of Health and the Department of Education in New York State to work together to create a book of guidelines for how to take care of food allergic children in schools. And then I was fortunate enough to work on the guidelines, but that started just like Stacy mentioned about the playground because a mother came into my support group one day and she was holding a book in her hands and it was from Massachusetts. And she said, look, Massachusetts has this great book on how to care for kids with food allergies in schools. Why doesn't New York have one? And I said, geez, I don't know. Why doesn't New York have one? And so we, we started working on it and we got one of the local not-for-profits involved to help us. And um, that one, really it was also very fast, it took about um, a year or so to pass. So there was a lot, a lot of groups involved, a lot of advocates involved, but so that's probably, I think the schools, that's what I'm most passionate about in general. And, you know, that's where our kids are for eight hours a day, especially for those kids who haven't been diagnosed yet. Many of them have their first reaction in schools. So 
you know, Stacy and I have worked on, as you mentioned before, stock epinephrine so that schools can have epinephrine on hand in case somebody who's undiagnosed has a reaction and, and access to epinephrine and working with um, making sure that children can carry. That was the self-carry law that Stacy referred to. So really, I think the majority of the work that I've been involved in, you know, revolves around schools. I think that's where my passion is, really. So I know you said Maya is 22. Can you say anything about what it was like for her to graduate and move into early adulthood? What well, she's graduating that? this year. She's graduating next month. She'd be very upset if you, she heard oh. you say that she's already graduated. She's, oh. she's holding on to every moment she can. But yes, yeah, so she, well, it's it's funny that you mentioned that. I think first I would say that every transition is complicated with food allergies, whether it's going from being at home to nursery school, then the bubble gets a little bigger, then you're going to elementary school. The jump from high school to college is big. Um, and of course, the jump from college to real life is going to be big as well. But we just had our first question about this come up last night. She was applying for um, a position for after college. She's going to be going on to medical school, possibly to be an allergist. We don't know. But uh, <laughs> she's going to be taking a year off between now and medical school. So she wants a, a job in, in the medical profession. And she called me last night. She said, Mom, I don't know how to answer this question. They're asking if I on the job application if I have a disability. And I thought about that for a second and I thought, well, I mean, yeah, food allergies is covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. It is a disability. It does affect um, a major life function, which is breathing, if you have an anaphylactic reaction and that's the definition of it. But I still wasn't sure. And then she looked and it had a list. It said, for example, one of these. And while food allergies was not on the list, maybe we'll talk to them about change, celiac disease was, which is another food um, related disease. So when I saw that celiac was on it, I said, you know what, honey, I think, I think, yes, you have to answer. Yes, that is true. And, and then, you know, we brought her father in to get his opinion on it. And because I was still kind of hesitant, I was afraid that maybe that would be a reason not to hire her if she had a disability. But then my husband said, you know what, we've got it. She's got to be up front in the beginning. She might need accommodations from her employers. She's got to, she's got to say it right up front that yes, she has a disability and, and this is what it is. So I think every transition is difficult, but this one, certainly she has the experience of all the others behind it to, to move forward with. So I think she'll be, I think she'll be fine. Absolutely. And one of the things working in the clinic setting is we recognize the education if it starts right away and then you're just building on it. Everything is a step to the next. So where, what's the next challenge or next new thing you would have to do that you haven't done yet? How do we work toward that? So I know Maya couldn't be with us because she's at the end of her semester, yes. but we really, for MCATs, actually. <laughs> we're so excited that she would like to join us in the future to talk yeah. more about what those experiences have been like for her. And now as she goes into this next phase of life. Mm -hmm. So we are almost out of time and I'd like to open it. Does anybody have anything that they would like to share that we haven't been able to touch on yet? I think the only thing that I wanted to say, particularly to uh, people out there who are thinking, gosh, I'd, I'd like to be an advocate, but I just don't know where to get started. It can sound very overwhelming. Like, you know, I was just, Stacey and I were just in Washington, D.C. last week advocating for some of these bills. And um, I spoke to people who are not yet, you know, as experienced at advocacy work. And I said, the most important thing that you can remember when you're nervous about getting into advocacy, you know, to go up and talk at Capitol Hill or in your state capitol, you don't have to start with that, right? And the fact of the matter is every one of you watching this program has started already because from the minute your baby was diagnosed with food allergies, you had to advocate for that baby, whether it was with a babysitter or nursery school or a play date, you've already been advocating. You just didn't realize it. So just if you keep that in mind, I think it makes it easier to jump to the next step and say, you know what, maybe I can talk to my school district and try to get some food allergy policies in place. And from there, you'll think, you know what? that can easily be replicated for my county. Maybe I should go to my county with that. And so just think of it as, as little pieces, little increments and don't think, oh, I can't be an advocate. I can't go to Capitol Hill. That sounds so overwhelming. It, it, you can get there. Thank you. I agree with what um, Jill just said. And I also agree that, um, you know, you've, everyone 
uh, who's watching here who has a child with food allergies, you are already, like Jill said, your child's biggest advocate and you have that knowledge. And as Jared was saying earlier, so many times we meet with these um, lawmakers and, and policymakers who really don't know and haven't experienced life with food allergies. And they want to hear what you have to say because they're in a position to do something to make um, you know life better for people living with food allergies. And so by using your voice, you're not only helping you know people with food allergies, but you're helping these lawmakers who otherwise wouldn't know, oh, this is something we could do to make you know life better for and safer for someone with food allergies. So your voice is very powerful, as Jared said. And Jared, what? How would you end things for us today? Um, I mean, I would just the same thing as uh, Jill and my mom, just saying like, what well, our voices are powerful, and I bet this goes for all everyone who advocates for food allergies. We're not just advocating for ourselves, but we're advocating for everyone. We're trying to make a safer world for everyone. We're trying to make everyone's life safe. No one have to worry and everyone just live the best life they can. And, you know, people with food allergies might not see themselves as normal because, you know, they get left out sometimes, but that's not true. But because you can do whatever you want and you just have to put a little extra effort into it, like we talked about earlier. And it's all about just um, believing in yourself. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for your preparation and your ability to join us today. And for those of you watching from the Mary H. Weiser Food Allergy Center at the University of Michigan, we thank you for your advocacy work that we're sure you're already doing on behalf of the food allergy community.